Kia ora koutou. I'm Sophie Thorne, curator collections at the Adam Art Gallery Te Pakta Katoi. I co-curated the exhibition Listening Stones, Jumping Rocks, alongside Sue Ballard, Associate Professor of Art History at Te Hiranga Waka, Victoria University of Wellington. Listening Stones, Jumping Rocks began as an exhibition drawing on items from the Victoria University of Wellington art collection. However, it quickly expanded into a group exhibition with key loaned works. Together, these works spoke to Sue and I as a way to offer a re-examination of the boundaries between human and non-human, life and living, speculation and imagination. And, as we write in the introductory text, gathered in this way, they represent a timeline of engagements with the environment. They mourn the sixth great extinction. They ask us to be a witness. They combine ritual with research. They speak back. They remind us of our relationship with both materials and whenua. They turn to the planet. They raise questions of what might be seen and heard amidst the material ecologies of the Anthropocene. Rewa Martin is the only artist out of the 14 in the exhibition who is represented as both an artist in the collection with her 2012 work Forlorn and with a borrowed work, her third iteration of Grey Wacky Love Poems, Grey Wacky Love Poems Returns, Returns. This work was originally conceived as an outdoor public work on Poneke's south coast. It was exciting to see this work restaged in the gallery and moulded to our internal stairwell. Due to the nature of the unique materials she uses, it is also fascinating to be able to continue to watch it change over the course of the exhibition. The exhibition opened in November 2021 and runs until the 27th of March 2022. Its opening coincided with the first conference in Aotearoa by the Association for the Study of Literature, Environment and Culture, Australia and New Zealand. Nga toho o te Conversations Beyond Human Scales. This conference was hosted at Te Hirangawaka by our Art History and English programs and the Centre for Science and Society. I hand over now to Ray Wynn to discuss Grey Wacky Love Poems and introduce Steph Lash, Jess Charlton and Joanna Knox. All four speakers were also presenters at this conference. Kia ora Sophie and hello everyone. My name is Raywin Martin and today I'll be speaking along with Jess Charlton and Stephanie Lash, followed with a reading by Johanna Knox. I'll begin by talking about Grey Wacky Love Poems Returns 2019, made at the old Ofero Bay Quarry on Pornicky's south coast, around from Te Whanganuia Tara, uh, and also the earlier phase of the project in the Courtney Place lightboxes. As Sophie mentioned, this work was reconfigured for Listening Stones Jumping Rocks, reusing many of the materials seen in the video and images we're sharing today. We will also talk a little about the music video Adventure, made in 2019 at the same quarry site for Ōtipoti based musician Steph Animal. I'll then introduce work in progress toward Playing the Machine, a new series of moving image works that will be shown at the Douse Art Museum later this year. Playing the Machine features misuse of industrial petrochemical plastic extruders to process biopolymer uh, materials similar to some of what you'll see um, currently installed at the Adam Art in the Adam Art Gallery stairwell. In each of the projects we're speaking about today, and the work in progress toward Playing the Machine, we draw connections between histories of bio-based plastics and colonisation, an understanding of plasticity through time, within and beyond the scales of human and colonial utility. I will speak to the origins of Grey Wacky Love Poems, the materials involved, and my collaboration with Jess, who will then speak more about film and filmmaking as ecological systems, a different way of thinking about the machinery of art making. Steph will also give her responses to this work in the context of Listening Stones, Jumping Rocks, and speak a little toward writing for the upcoming exhibition at the Dows Art Museum. We'll then um, end with a reading of new work by Johanna Knox, whose poems are included in the 2019 Grey Wacky Love Poems Returns book that is available at the exhibition reading table in the Adam Art Gallery. Joanna's new work flows from the Awa and floodplains of Te Whanganui Atara and further up toward the Manawatū. 
These rivers, particularly Te Awa Kairangi or Hutt River, have also long been sources of the shingly grey wacky aggregates used in roading and building within the region. I'm beginning with images of the old Ofero Bay quarry beachfront and the 2019 grey wacky love poems light boxes on Porniki's Courtney Place, which was once harbour for Shore. Jess and I began working together in 2018 when Jess created drone photographs toward these larger lightbox composites. Uh, I'd followed Jess's earlier works with drone that she had learned how to build before they were available off the shelf. You'll see some of these drone images in the background of the lightboxes and during Johanna's reading. For context, the question of biobased paints arose in 2012 when I'd been making large scale wall paintings using petrochemical house paints. I wanted a paint that could rehydrate, moving between liquid and solid, to create paintings where images are reconstituted. This led to my current work with paint binders derived from living materials rather than fossil derived ones. Though, as Metis scientist Max Leboiron acknowledges, fossils were once alive too. In the 21st century, biobased plastics are often referred to as new materials when actually they are old. Fossilised polystyrene and rubber vulcanised through geologic processes are plastics that have occurred beyond human timescales. Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples' use of biopolymers, uh, materials like seaweed, natural rubber and plant or bark-based cellulosic materials, predates petrochemical plastics. Uh, Central and Middle American Indigenous peoples process natural latex with similar results to later vulcanisation processes. Bacterial polyester was observed by French scientists as early as 1926. In these longer histories of creative use, we see working methods of plasticity that are sensitive and resistant to extractive industry. Some of the plant and bacterial plastics you can see in this documentation of Grey Wacky Love Poems returns out at the coast and currently in the stairwell at the Adam are thermoplastics processed with extruder machines at Scion, a Crown Research Institute in Rotorua. These plastics have capacity for polymorphous shape memory and can be moulded into one shape at a particular temperature and then deformed. When the material is heated to that initial temperature again, it remembers that prior moulded shape. Heat becomes a trigger for memory. So there's some resonance there between human neuroplasticity and this more than human plasticity. Jess and I also worked together on the music video adventure for Otipoti Dunedin based musician and game designer Steph Animal. Again using the quarry as a site, this project developed our understanding of play and adventure as methodologies. The next set of images and video focuses on playing the machine, filmed by Jess as I work with uh, te technician and scientist Beatrix Theobald at Scion. The plastics being processed by these extruder machines are generated by bacterial organisms through fermentation and metabolization of various forms of carbon feedstock. In a circular economy where waste is recycled and reused, this feedstock would often be horticultural and food waste. Creating systems for this kind of circular economy in Aotearoa is part of Sion's work. We are making Playing the Machine within a state-funded Crown Research Institute that first began as a colonial forest research lab. We're attempting to understand a range of biopolymers and how they exist within and beyond industrial applications. Beatrix Theobald previously worked as a chef and now working at Scion, her creativity as a cook supports our work to misuse the industrial extruder machines. At institutions like this, biopolymers are being made to fit within existing petrochemical production models and infrastructures. This addresses an urgent need for large-scale industrial transition away from the oil industry um, and it also serves the interests of capital. So how does plasticity escape that petrohegemony and also find space for concerns beyond the bubble of corporate interests toward more symbiotic and redistributive economies? And what becomes of machines and production when play is introduced?
Kia ora koutou. This is Jess Charlton, a cinematographer and filmmaker. Raven's work inspires me to be experimental, to use the camera in different ways and to see myself as an active participant in a painting, seeing, making ecosystem. Not just documenting the process, but part of the process. As Raywin and Beatrix misuse the machines at Scion, I misuse the seeing showing machine that is the camera. The operators, Beatrix, Raywin and I, operate in a way that mixes technology, skill, intuition and responsiveness to the environment that we're in as well as being part of. In the filming of playing the machine too, I used two cameras, one with a tilt shift lens. My, my response to the environment was to literally shift the perspective. It's not particularly comfortable being in the ex extrusion lab. It's loud and hot and there was something that I found oppressive about the space. I later identified it as being the colour of the machines. It's a particular type of yellow. On researching the colour psychology of yellow, I find while it can be an energetic colour, this intensity can also have a downside. Sometimes yellow can come off as very aggressive and even confrontational. In great quantities, people may be left feeling irritated or, or even angry when surrounded by yellow. Then I remembered that my bedroom when I was very young was that exact shade of yellow. Thankfully, my parents wallpapered wallpapered over it. I wonder if they saw something in that colour or its effect on me back then too. So in the editing process I decided to change the colour of the machines. This is the colour that felt right. As well as playing with the colour scale I also played with the time scale. When you alter your perspective of scale you see the world in a different way. When the time perception ratio is increased, you can more effectively see the dance that Beatrix and Raywin perform with the machine as they misuse it to create their new materials. But is it really misuse? Technology is a constantly morphing part of our ecology. Machines are made to be played with. Machines are made through play. Peter Beck, engineer and CEO of Ro Rocket Lab, made pretty impressive rockets out of Lego when he was a child. I know this because we played with Lego together when we were children. Once. We had a mutual friend. Rocket Lab's rockets are just larger and more complex versions of Peter's Lego rockets. The use of Rocket Lab's rockets is dictated by capital and the driving need for technological pro progress the techno-capitalist industrial military complex. I would call this misuse. Cameras and other kinds of seeing machines have a genealogy that can be traced back to the technology of war. Now that cameras have become more de democratic and there's a critical mass of people who have multiple forms of cameras literally at our fingertips and attached to our screens, they're pretty much part of us, or at least part of what we do. We're all camera operators, machine operators. Beatrix and Raywin's machine misuse is actually an evolutionary milestone in machinic ecology. Tēnā tātou, ko Stephanie Lash tēnē a Marata here in Wellington. Being able to respond to Raywin and Jess's works that they've created together in a part gives me a kind of brain explosion that'll be familiar to anyone who likes to create things. You feel a moment of possibility and excitement that something new is happening that you've never encountered before and that you might be bringing something into existence. I'm deeply captivated by Raywin's artistic interrogation of bio-based polymers and your work to develop a paint material that's got a circular material cycle that you can develop back into liquid. Paintings that could move between liquid and solid and reconstitute themselves into new forms. 
I find a kind of existential comfort and safety in what we learn through the telescope of our experience that the world and the universe is just happening according to processes that were established without our input and experience. And it's there for us to discover. I feel this feeling when I watch the works that Jess Charlton has created of Raven's work in Playing the Machine and hearing of her own visceral emotional reactions when she filmed the processes that reminded her of biological processes being translated through Raven's hands. Raven's manipulation not only of form but of substance of the bio-based polymer substrates in Grey Wacky Love Poems gives me so much pleasure to contemplate because of this feeling it gives me of bringing something new into existence. An interest in plate tectonics and geology recently collided with Ray Wynn and Jess's work when Ray invited us to consider the fossil record. I've recently been interested in the geology of the yellow band near the summit of the tallest mountain in the world, giving it a name feels wonderful and absurd. Chomolongma or Sagamatha are two indigenous names for Mount Everest. The yellow bands are striking yellow colored sandstone layer near the summit that I'm interested in for the wayfinding capabilities that it provides climbers up there in what's called the death zone. Climbers know they've hit it when their crampons hit hard rock. The fossil record shows that what is now on the roof of the world was once a seabed teeming with life and color. Fossils collected and returned from close to the summit include sea lilies and arthropods, like little bug guys, like trilobites and ostracods. The feeling that this piece of knowledge gives me is one I often encounter in my work as an archivist when I look at the materiality of the actual physical objects that we hold. And a twin feeling in my instinct as a writer to deliver a story of transformation, that feeling of minding your own business and being thrust into what might as well be another dimension. Marine animals and plant life, once just going about their own lives, suddenly now find themselves fulfilling a role as the summit of the highest mountain on earth. Archival documents that need to be particularly long lived to record the evidence of our decision making, think of te tiriti or waitangi, are often made on parchment, which is a very durable material, often made of sheep, goat or calf skin. And recently, DNA analysis determined that the two joined parchments of the Waitangi sheet of Te Tiriti or Waitangi are sheep. And I find a sense of absurd wonder and thinking of those sheep going about their lives in the fields of probably Western Europe somewhere in the 1830s, unaware that the next chapter of their lives were to be joined together, thrust into the spotlight as the substrate for a nation founding document. Isn't the world amazing? Tina tato kato, he uriya ho, no ngati tu kore he, no ngati kahuki tauranga, he pakia hoki ho. I live in Tafanganui Atara on Taranaki Fanui and Te Ateawa lands, and I'm doing a creative writing PhD here at the International Institute of Modern Letters at Victoria University Te Hiringa Waka. The short extracts I'm reading are from an essay in progress called Floodplain some of which I presented at Ngā Tohu o Te Huariri. Haratua 2021 I hold a man in my palm, pretending to myself to consider. I should be cautious at Smutu Whenua, but my index finger already knows my uncautious mind. It sends him flying right and we tumble into each other's afternoons. He shuts his curtains against the sun, says he doesn't remember me, flatters me that he wishes he did. I tell him I used to see him often, down corridors, across courtyards, through classroom windows. Juniors knew who the seniors were, and we did have friends in common. Over the next few hours, we fit stories together, as well as our bodies. This way, that way, feeling for joining places, pushing against the limits of skin, words, memory. Our conversation observes the well-known landmarks, the pervious teachers, the best wagging spots. We fill each other in on gossip we'd forgotten we ever wanted to know, and we venture further. This is what happened in my house. This is how I hurt. Window panes vaporise. Distances across lino and concrete and years collapse. I hear the river flowing to Awakairangi. I feel its stones pushing into my spine smell their steaming surfaces. 
turn my nose the other way and clutch at the grass of the stop bank. That was the thing about Lower Hutt in the 80s, he says in a still moment. Your friends were either really poor or their parents were with an embassy. It's an exaggeration. I didn't fit either description. But as we curl into each other, stories cooling on our skins like waterweed, I think of all of us there, from up the line or over the sea, struggling with belonging to the suffocated floodplain we found ourselves on. Some really did belong, of course. But I didn't know that at the time. Most likely some of them didn't either. A long time ago, hardly any time ago at all, Te Awakairangi was a fertile place. It invited its people into a careful, productive relationship of embrace and retreat. In the 1830s, a new flood swept in, foreigners wanting to carve up the land and possess it. The people tried to hold them back, but these new British families had come this far and weren't going anywhere. Look, we're negotiating, the British said. They held out papers, see? Don't look at their hands, though. Look at their feet, shuffling softly. Look at their feet, quietly carrying them further and further onto the land, while their hands wave deal after unacceptable deal. At a certain point, their feet have carried them so far onto the land that they turn and say to the people, but aren't you the trespassers here? The British appointed a new governor to New Zealand then, George Grey, icier, angrier and better resourced by far than his predecessor. Grey wanted Māori cleared from Te Awakairangi without delay and sailed in with soldiers and warships. Negotiating's over he said. Villages burned. Ancestors' bones were pulled from the earth. Firearms were trained on heads and hearts and triggers pulled. The people in the floodplain were separated. The British moved in on the river in earnest then. They affixed houses round its wrists, its ankles, its throat. It broke free, killing some of them, so they tried again. Harder, tighter, heaping stop banks ever higher. Sometimes they could almost convince themselves they'd tamed it. They refused to say its real names. They called it Hut River. One more fawning tribute to a great friend of theirs back home, who was pulling strings and smoothing colonisation efforts. Soon they spoke of Te Awakairangi's entire surrounds as the Hut Valley, Lower Hut and upper hut. I was born in the hospital just down the road from the Battle of Bullcott's farm. It felt as if the shackled river shaped my life. The landscape I moved through shivered in the shadows of the stop banks, and no amount of green, evenly mown grass draped across them could make them seem kind. Nervousness about the river's sleeping power crept into local newspaper articles council plans, and conversations in coffee shops. It was never far from the collective mind. Perhaps it's no wonder that a pall of more diffuse anxiety also seemed to hang in the air over the suburbs around the hour, and that violence still, to me, seemed to seep up from the plain, through foundations and floorboards, dulling carpets, breathing on windows watching from shadows as keys turned in locks one way or the other way. After I left school, I tried to live in Tamaki Makoto, but I came back, not right back. Instead, for 30 years, I've shifted restlessly round the edges of the harbour that Te Awakairangi flows into. But my continuing need to inhale the air of the strangled river still takes me by surprise. And whenever I meet people from those floodplain houses, they set something ringing inside me. It's getting late. The man who doesn't remember me, although I remember him, checks his phone. We both have things to do. Right now, in this room, I love his own not belonging, and who he's grown himself into, out of the expanses of poured concrete and the acid cruelty of adults that pelted down season after season in that little city we grew up in. We linger on his doorstep, 
plan to see each other again. And then I'm walking quickly down the hill, away from his house, and in the direction once again of the harbour. The Kaiwharafara River and I travel together for a while, and I think of all the rivers we could rewild. The hill wants me to walk faster. The harbour drags me towards it, and I feel exhilarated. <laughs> 